Good. Well, if you'd like to have your Bibles open at Matthew chapter 6, or be turning to there, let me pray for us and for our children as they go out. Let's pray. Father, as we have already prayed, we do ask, Lord, that you would bless the ministry to our children this morning. We ask, Lord, that you would give them listening ears and receptive hearts to receive your word. And Father, we pray that likewise you would do for us. There are hard things in your word. There are things that we think we know uh, and we need help with to understand properly. Uh, We pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes, Lord. Speak to us and convict us by the power of your spirit even this morning. For we ask it in your name. Amen. Now, according to my pension provider, right, to to retire comfortably, that's their words, a single person needs to have a pot that pays out £37,300 annually. Okay. The average retirement income, though, in the UK, according to uh, gov.uk, is currently £18,000. 772. You almost wonder whether the pension company said, oh, we'll just double that one and stick that one up on our website. And so the advice that we're given then, of course, and I'm sure any adult here will know, is that we need to start paying into these funds as early as possible. Think about your future, says the financial world. Plan ahead, they tell us. Now, that's better advice, actually, than they know, isn't it? To think about your future to plan ahead, but maybe not for the reasons they think. Uh, For some of us, though, that that pension ship has sailed. (laughs) But is our comfort and our security really to be found in making sure that we have a tidy little financial nest egg tucked away somewhere? Is that where we'll find security? Is it really true that those who have the most wealth are the happiest or the most content even? I think we know the answer to that. But by all appearances, the world around us seems to believe it, doesn't it? Even if deep down they know otherwise, they seem to believe it. I I recently... Uh, I recently listened to the testimony of of a friend of mine, a fellow minister who grew up in a Nigerian church uh, where they preached the prosperity gospel. Perhaps you've heard of that. uh, uh, In his church, appeals were regularly made for people to give what they called seed offerings. Plant this seed offering. So you're, you're, you're asked to give what sometimes is a large sum of money to the church. Uh, and he told me on one occasion where, to the, the, to the dismay of his wife, who looked at him as he did it, he got up and handed over the car keys. They had no way to even get home. Why? Why would he do that? Well, so that he'd receive more back. Plant the seed and it grows. Plant a £1,000 seed and God will return it tenfold for you, he was taught. <laughs> it raises the question, doesn't it? So... Is that gift being given out of a generous, obedient heart to God? Or is it being given by a greedy one? That makes you think, doesn't it? Why? I mean, you've got to ask why, haven't you? When the Christian gospel proclaims that we have everything we need in Christ, and we'll see next week that he even promises to take care of our needs, when the example of the first church leaders is a life of simplicity, every man of them, Certainly not vast wealth. When the scriptures contain repeated warnings about the deceitfulness of wealth. When we see Jesus, the founder, as a man who's homeless and dependent on the hospitality of others. Or Paul, who can give you a catalogue of all of his sufferings. And who actually teaches on contentment to be happy with much or little. Why on earth would a supposed Christian disciple be taken in by such clearly false teaching? Because money is a powerful thing. Because money is a powerful thing. It makes us crazy. It gets a grip on us. It promises security to us. It promises infinite possibilities, doesn't it? What I could do. It fires up all kinds of desires and all kinds of fears in our hearts. And and so it's really important we think right about it, isn't it? 
Who of us has never spent a sleepless night, your mind buzzing, thinking about how you're going to make ends meet or pay a bill? Who of us has never imagined what we might do if a, if a great big financial lump sum landed in our laps? Oh, wouldn't that be fun? Money makes this world go round, so they say. And so it should be no surprise to us as we carry on into Matthew chapter 6, we see that Jesus has much to say to us as citizens of his kingdom. That's really what this is about, right? About our attitude towards money and worldly wealth. Now, we've observed so far in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus has continually warned about having our attention fixated on the outward appearance of what we do and think. When what really matters is what's going on in our hearts. That's the big issue. So as we go through the sermon, we've seen it, haven't we? Sure, you can keep a cool exterior, but are you hating your brother or sister in your heart? What God sees in your heart is murder in seed form if you're doing that. It's murder. It's it's murder in your heart. Sure, you've never been unfaithful to your wife. But is your heart plagued by lust? What God sees is adultery in the heart. Sure, everyone sees your wonderful, generous gift, but why are you giving it? For the reward of recognition so that people will give you a clap? Or to genuinely please God just because that's what he's asked you to do? Your prayers are loud and full of poetry, but who are you praying to? Are you hoping those around you will be impressed in some way by your piety, by your spirituality? Or are you actually praying to bear your heart to God, genuinely between you and him? And again here, as we finish off this little set of three, the praying fast, praying and, and giving and then fasting, let's have a look in verse 16 as Jesus addresses that last issue. When you fast, says Jesus, don't look somber like the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. It's the same formula again, isn't it, as we've seen previously. Uh, But here, can, can you see, really, the potential for hypocrisy, for wearing a mask and playing a role, right, is extremely high when it comes to fasting. It's, 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 it's rich ground for it, isn't it? I think that's probably even more so today, you know, in a culture where fasting is actually quite unusual. The only command for the Jewish nation about fasting, actually in Jesus' day, was that they were to fast on the Day of Atonement. That's really the only one you can get from the law. But the Pharisees, they had a, they had a bi-weekly fast to be a good Pharisee. Uh, they kept it religiously. Mondays and Thursdays, they went without food. And if we know that, <laughs> at, this, at this point in history, so did everybody else know that. Apparently, they liked everybody, everybody to know about it. That's what we see here and what Jesus says, isn't it? So they were put on a somber mood and a pained expression on their face. They wouldn't wash. I mean, this is a hot country. They're not washing. They're not looking after themselves. They put some ashes on their heads to look really dejected, really miserable. You see the Pharisee coming. He looks miserable. It must be Monday, right? And, and you know... I'm so, I'm so hungry, they'll be saying. Oh, but you know what? It pleases God. It's what God wants. And anyone who saw them and realized the pain and the discipline that they might be enduring, having missed breakfast, poor things, would behold them in admiration. That's, I mean, that's really what they wanted, isn't it? And it's that admiration, says Jesus, that is their Look at the words carefully. Full reward. That's all the reward you're getting, if that's why you're doing it. It's your full reward. Well done. You've impressed people. Good for you. But God cares nothing for that kind of hypocrisy. You see the principle again. It's not about the outside. It's about what's going on in here, and it always is. Now, I don't know if you ever fast. 
It's an interesting thing. We don't teach on it very much, do we? In the Bible, people do it for a variety of reasons, and they're all valid. It's done as a way of focusing the mind on your devotion to God in prayer. Some people find it really sharpens the mind, helps them to pray. People pray in the Bible to, to avert some kind of danger or threat when something's, when something's happening, they, they fast before God, or to express sorrow and loss, or to express repentance or grief, to express your longing for Jesus' return. That's a New Testament version, isn't it, of fasting? And Jesus actually said, because his disciples didn't fast, did they? But he said, no, how can you fast when the bridegroom is with you? But when the bridegroom goes, in the longing for his return, yeah, yeah, then they will fast. It's a good and biblical discipline, but the issue actually is, not to get distracted by the whole topic of fasting, the issue is, how should we fast? And the long long and short of it, if you look at verses 17 to 18, is really, in a nutshell, no one should be able to tell. Isn't it? That's what Jesus is saying. No one should be able to tell. If you want this to be a genuine act of devotion to God, then keep it strictly between you and him. Wash, says Jesus. Wear, put on the clean clothes. Smile. Use deodorant, whatever the, the cultural equivalent is. Nobody should know anything's going on with you. I mean, you might have to suppress the old rumbly tummy, perhaps. But nobody should be able to suppress. So no one should be able to see what's going on. And so we see that principle laid out again. God cares what's going on in your heart. And that, that now is why God needs to speak about your treasure. That's why Jesus needs to address your treasure. Because, as he so memorably puts it, and we know the line, don't we, in verse 21. Look at it. This is why it's so important. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So there's three things this morning then I want you to see Jesus says here that you need to know about money, that you need to know about earthly treasure. Let's look at them together. The first one is that money will betray you. Money betrays. Have a look at verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, with all of this negative talk about wealth and money, it's important to understand, I think out from the outset, that wealth per se is not being condemned here. Jesus is not anti-wealth. Money is, after all, in itself neither good nor bad. There's the issues around it that are the problem. Elsewhere in the Bible, just to be clear, we are encouraged to be prudent with our money. There's nothing wrong with financial forward planning in order to bless others. Have a look at the wisdom of the book of Proverbs. From Proverbs 13, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. That's two, two generations on is the good man is thinking. He's thinking about what his money can do when he's gone. What good can it do? There's nothing wrong with saving. In fact, not doing so is considered foolish in the Old Testament. Have a look at Proverbs 6. Go to the ant, you sluggard, you lazy person. Consider its ways and be wise. What's so special about the ant? It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Clever ant, storing away stuff when, it's, when there's lots around so that there'll be something for when there's not. And we're encouraged, thirdly, to enjoy God's blessings with a thankful heart. We're not, we're not to be, you know, some kind of stoic people. 1 Timothy chapter 4 says, everything God created is good. Nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it's consecrated by the word of God and prayer. But you see, money, wealth, can be treacherous if it starts to rule our hearts. If what we're doing in our hearts isn't right with it. Let me point this out. Just just try and make it clear. A saver is different from a miser. Can you see the difference? It's a difference of heart, isn't it? 
Say, are you a saver or a miser? Enjoyment is quite different from greed and gluttony, isn't it? It's a heart issue again. And we all know the verse, uh, but we ought to be careful as we co- quote it, that we quote it correctly. 1 Timothy 6.10, Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. What's the problem? Love of money is the problem. When you look carefully at what Jesus says here, it's very interesting. Take a look at verse 19. He's warning here about laying up treasures for who? For ourselves. There's a strong hint right here from the outset, isn't it, that Jesus is addressing a selfish attitude towards our treasure, inward-looking use of money. If our wealth and all the possessions we have stored away for the future are what give us a sense of security then we have a, cause, a great cause for concern. If all we want to do you know, is to spend what we have on our pleasures, something is seriously amiss in our hearts. James writes about that, doesn't he? And not only that, it's, it's actually it's utter folly. It's folly. Why? Because wealth will not ultimately deliver the goods. If we invest in worldly treasure... It will betray us. And verse 19 demonstrates that wealth is always attack. Under, sorry, is always under attack here on earth. Have a, look at, have a look at how it gets attacked. First of all come the moths. Do you see that? And think about Jesus' hearers, his audience in, in these days. What, possession could they, what possessions could they possibly accumulate? Well, maybe one thing they might be able to get their hands on is, is some ni- a nice set of clothes, Right? And I'll keep those because they're my Sunday best. They're my special clothes. And I'm going to store them away to keep them, to keep them you know, valuable. I've got, I've got something in the cupboard, right? But as soon as you store them away, what happens? They're moth food. The hungry moth comes. And they're ruined. And all their value is lost. No one wants a half-eaten shirt with holes in it. And then comes along the rust. Look. Scholars think that both corrosion corrosion and erosion are being talked about here in this word. So you've got yourself a nice, you know, some nice equipment, nice swords, some nice tools, your gardening equipment, your farming equipment. As soon as you put them away in the barn, as soon as you store them away for the next time you want to use them, the rust is attacking them. The rust is at the surface, eating them up, consuming them. Or you, you store away some grain and the vermin sneak in. I think that's also intended in this. And they erode your store of grain. They're nibbling at the edges, like rust nibbles at the edges. You know, just what happens in the world is all of your possessions get nibbled at. That's the point. You build a house and even that's not safe from the erosion of the weather. Even the bricks and mortar will, will erode. The roof leaks, the timbers creak. Gen, you know, you're spending tons and tons on, on maintenance. And then the thieves come, says Jesus. Now, this word for breaking in in this verse describes the act, actually, of digging, digging through the mud walls of the home. You know, your house is not very secure for the average person in Jesus' day. They dig through the mud, like they dug through the roof to let the man in. And they take what you've stored away in your home, where you thought it was safe, and you, you, you weren't worried about it anymore. And if wealth was precarious in Jesus' day, it's even more so today, isn't it? Markets crash overnight. History's seen that. Interest rates start to just shoot up, don't they? For those of you borrowing, that's a big problem. But then sometimes they collapse for those of you who've got savings, and even your savings don't really deliver anything. And then a big expense just lands on the doormat. Something lands in your lap. You weren't expecting it. And a pang of anxiety in your heart. Criminals get away with the pension pot. And suddenly you're left, well, nothing. Scammers disappear with your hard-earned savings. What a precarious world we live in for wealth. 
And then ultimately, do you know what? What about death? Isn't that really the big issue with storing up your treasure here? On that last day of your life on this earth, I mean, your wealth will mean nothing at all. Goes to who knows who. A big chunk of it probably goes to the government. And if your security is tied up then exclusively in your wealth, you're devastated by this. How can you guard against such devastation? Let me give you the best financial advice that I can give you. You've got to store your treasure somewhere totally secure. Jesus tells you where. He says, store it in heaven. Store it in heaven, says Jesus, where nothing can touch it. Where it will wait for you, for your eternal enjoyment. Now, we've already seen, haven't we, that there is eternal significance. There is reward for a lot of the things that we do that Jesus has talked about here in, in this sermon. When we do our righteous deeds, our praying, our fasting, our giving, giving out, of a, out of a heart desire to please God alone, there's treasure in heaven for that. When we suffer for Christ's sake, there's treasure. When we forgive each other, there's treasure. Most importantly of, of all, listen carefully, there is an inheritance. There is, there is inherit an inheritance that is more than you could possibly ever need for all who will simply come with a repentant heart and put their trust in Christ. He's paid for that inheritance with the most precious substance in existence, his own precious blood. There's that for you if you'll put your faith in him. That is secure. Now today, we're sort of acknowledging the, the, the harvest celebration, aren't we, in our service. We recognise that God has been good to us. The crops have come in, our needs are supplied. As a nation, we have much, don't we? And more than we need. But we also use this day to remind ourselves that there is a more important harvest. Did you see that in every one of those songs that we sang at the beginning of the service? That God has called workers like you and me into his harvest field to sow the seed of his wondrous gospel, his life-changing gospel, his eternity-changing gospel into the world that we live in. Now that is a cause worth giving to, isn't it? If God's moved your heart to be involved in, in that or, or to contribute to it, even if it's only financially to that cause, then do it simply before him alone. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. And that, brothers and sisters, is treasure in heaven. It's stored up, it's safe. It's way better than any pension pot, seriously. But here's the thing, do you believe it? Do you, do you actually believe that? Jesus finishes this treasure illustration by calling your bluff, calling my bluff on this. It's interesting, actually, if you look at the grammar of verse 21, you can't pick it up because of the way that we write in English, but actually it switches to a singular you. Yeah, it's, he's now, he's, it's now as if he's been plural all the way through verse 19 and 20, but now it's as if Jesus is just in this sentence, he's eyeballing you individually. Want to know where your treasure is? Well, what, what is it that you spend most time thinking about, planning, investing in? Jesus is uncomfortably black and white for us. Because what you cher cherish, what you obsess over, what rolls around in your heart is what's going to take control of your life. And you cannot sit on the fence, says Jesus. You cannot have one half of your heart here in the world and another heart, half of your heart over there in heaven. You've got to decide, where are you going to invest and it's a vitally important decision because verse 21 states it clearly. Look, your heart will follow where you've stored your treasure. Your heart will go where, your where you've put your treasure. 
That's the point. That's where your heart will go. That's why it's so crucial to think about where you're storing it, what you're valuing. Store it on earth and the world will have your heart. Store it in heaven and God will have your heart. Need to be warned, we need to hear this, don't we? Money, wealth, it will betray you in the end. It's it's, it's as trustworthy as a sandcastle on the beach and the tide's coming in. It betrays. Secondly, money blinds. Have a look, verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, what's going on here in this verse? It can sound a little bit obscure when you first read it. The picture here is of our our eyes, I think, being like windows in a dark house, right? If those windows are good windows, right? So if if those windows are unobstructed, the curtains are pulled aside, yeah, it's good windows, good glass, whatever it is, yeah? If they are good and unobstructed, and just as important... If those windows are facing the right way, then the room will be well lit. Yes, south-facing windows. That's what you want, isn't it? You want lots of light in the room. So, first, where then are you fixing your eyes? There's a deep darkness, you see, this verse tells us, within those who have turned their eyes away from God, away from the source of light. But if you will fix your eyes on Jesus, and if you will see him clearly for who he is, without putting anything to obscure that, if you will view him with eyes of faith, then you will be full of light. I think that's what this verse is telling us. You'll be fully illuminated. Your whole person will be illuminated. Jesus is warning here about having bad eyes. The word actually is is bad or evil, having evil eyes, he's talking about. What are evil eyes? What are bad eyes? Jesus uses that exact expression in a parable that Matthew tells later on. It's in Matthew 20, if you want to look at it. It's a story about the owner of a vineyard who employs workers, you know the story, don't you, At, at various times of the day, Uh, And so you've got some workers that start right at the crack of dawn. You've got some that start, you know, one hour before clocking off time and and, and the whole range between them. And then when, uh, when it comes time for pay, pay time at the end of the day, in his generosity, the owner of the vineyard pays those who've who've only started an hour before clocking off time, exactly the same amount as he promised and agreed to pay the first workers. They all get the same pay. (laughs) And you can imagine what happens. There's complaints, there's murmuring. And this is what the owner says in verse 15 of Matthew 20. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? I'm the one with all the money. I'm the employer. You agreed to work for what you agreed to work for. Don't I now, are you saying I no longer have the right to be a, to be a generous employer to others? Or are you envious? That word is exactly the same word being used here by Jesus. It Literally, that verse is saying, or are your eyes evil? It's literally what the verse is saying. We've we've translated it into just the word envious because that's the the thought that's being captured. Are your eyes evil because I'm generous? You're looking at these who've received generously and your eyes have become evil. You see, the evil eye is the one that's motivated by personal gain. And hence it covets what others have. Money blinds when it makes us us turn our eyes away from Jesus and fix them on the treasures of this world. That is a blindness. If your eye is bad, if that's where you're looking, you're looking at the darkness, if your eye is bad, all your decisions will be made on the basis of earthly gain, selfish gain. How will this benefit me and mine? And that will 
turn you into a stingy, begrudging person when it comes to giving. You'll put yourself into financial commitments because you're going to make bad decisions pursuing these things. A promotion or a job opportunity comes up and you, oh, that's all you can see. You're just looking at the number. And suddenly you realise, oh, I can't make my commitments to church anymore. It's blindness. Once you pull those curtains, the darkness will become greater and greater. Don't fix your eyes on that, warns Jesus. Money blinds us. Money also binds us. That's the second, the third thing here. It blinds and it binds. It enslaves. Look at verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That's the bottom line. See, this third picture is a picture of slavery. And it is slavery here. It's not, we're not talking about service. We're talking about slavery. A servant, you know, and an employee, if it was just a servant, you could, you could work for two employers, couldn't you? you? You could do that. But a slave has only one master. That's the point here. How does money enslave? I think we kind of know, don't we? First of all, it never satisfies. It will just keep you on a treadmill wanting more. They say that John D. Rockefeller, the first American billionaire, was asked by a reporter, how much money is enough? To which he calmly responded, just a little more. It's a slavery, isn't it? Just a little more. Money leaves those who pursue it always wanting more. It promises happiness and delivers misery. Or we see something and, and, and that we want and we overreach and end up in, and then the interest rates change, right? How many people are in that situation now, enslaved to, to, to their borrowing? And we can no longer do, any, do the things we wanted to with our money. We can no longer do good with our money because it's all tied up. You, you're, you're like a slave, aren't you? You're dancing to its tune. It's a dangerous thing, isn't it? And so Jesus once again presents us with a choice of only two options here. You've got two masters, and you must pick which one. You cannot serve both God and money. God is jealous over his people. You see it all through the pages of Scripture. He will not share you with another master. He will not share you with another God. I mean, imagine, if you, um, imagine if you were working for... You're trying to work two jobs, and you decided, I'm going to work for Apple, and I'm going to work for Microsoft. Can you imagine, if they found out about that, how long you'd keep your job? I remember in Kingston once, I used to go to the Starbucks across from where I worked, and I, I went in there, and they had a new employee one morning, and I looked at him, and I, I smiled at him, because he had a name badge on that said Costa. And he's working, working for Starbucks. I said, mate, I bet that goes down well around here. He wasn't there the next week. He'd gone. They'd fired him. And, uh, you know, if, if, if a coffee company will do that, they're not having that. You can imagine, can't you? Imagine saying to God, oh, God, of all the gods that I love in this world, Father, I love you the most. It's not going to cut it, is it? It's not how it works. We must be undivided. Imagine saying that to your spouse. Darling, of all the women I love, I love you most of all. <laughs> Jesus demands that we choose. Who will you give your heart to? You must give your heart to God completely. It's God or money. So where then is your heart? This morning, that's what we need to think about. Where then is your heart? You don't want to say, you don't want to serve a master like money. He'll blind you, he'll enslave you. If you will serve God, he'll set you free. Now, we're all fickle creatures. If you're anything like me, you feel the pull of this world. You feel the pull of the things around you and the things that other people have. And, and you see it and it looks so good and covetousness wells up in your heart. It's hard 
not to believe that a little bit more money would just make things a bit better. That a financial nest egg would give you the security you need in years to come. It's hard not to believe that. And so we need God to go to work on our hearts, don't we? This is going to be supernatural. We need this hard heart softened once again, don't we? We need him to open our eyes so that by faith we see the true worth of heaven. We see especially the true value of heaven's king. And so if these warnings about wealth have cut you to the heart this morning, won't you join me in running to Jesus Christ? Confessing the poverty of your heart, mourning the covetousness within it. If you are thirsting for righteousness, won't you come to him? He promises to fill you. So let's finish once again this morning, just with a moment of quiet. Perhaps you've realized the futility of investing in this world, that it offers no hope for the world to come. Perhaps you've realized for the first time you need to come to Jesus with repentance and faith this morning and ask him to save you and make you fit for heaven. Perhaps your heart has strayed and you need to fix your eyes on him again. Devote yourself once more to your master. The dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, Help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. Father, may our hearts be undividedly yours. May we, your people, fix our eyes on your Saviour. Set our hearts on heaven and invest our all in treasure there. The greatest of which is, is your Son our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose good name we pray. Amen.